Welcome to one more session of Mikraut. Today, I have the honor of interviewing Professor Stephen Hicks, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, how capitalism is actually a really good friend for women, and how women in Latin America who are struggling to get out of poverty can become even more profitable than the stock market of New York. Uh, Professor Hicks, Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and I wanna start uh, this conversation inspired in your article of the Wall Street Journal called What Entrepreneurs Can Teach Us About Life. Here you, you present the, the idea that all of us are born with the ability of taking risks. Sometimes mm -hmm. when people think about entrepreneurs, they think Steve Jobs or they think Bill Gates or they think uh, Jeff Bezos. But mm. Mikraud is an example of uh, women uh, struggling uh, to get out of poverty in Latin America and they become successful entrepreneurs and they take risks. So it, it, it seems uh, that we all as humans have the, the capacity of becoming entrepreneurs. But what does it take? What is the difference in between the ones that make it and the ones that don't? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's nicely said. Now, I think everyone is born an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, those of us who've spent some time with children, children are naturally curious. They are naturally wanting to explore the world, both you know, intellectually and, and physically. They, uh, they take risks. And of course, they, they fail a lot, but they come back and they try again and they learn from their failures. And there's a kind of a joy at developing their physical capacities and their intellectual capacities. And uh, while, of course, uh, children are uh, in a position of dependence with respect to their, their parents, and so we have a, a safety net around them, uh, healthy children very much want to be independent. They, they like to be able to move on their own. They take pride when they can dress themselves, when they solve a problem. And then, then they say things like, you know, mommy, look what I did, or, or daddy, right? watch, me, watch me do this. And that, I think, is a natural human development. Uh, but I think the, the tragedy is that so many people, because of uh, restrictive parenting or, or, or anti-entrepreneurial parenting, and then uh, worse, when many children go off to school and they're basically you know, forced to sit for hours and hours and hours and just do regurgitation lessons under an authority, right? and or especially in the poor parts of the world, and without exception, the poor parts of the world are basically uh, societies that do not let people pursue their dreams and give them the free space to develop as human beings. I, I think it's important that, that we talk about that because at least in Latin America, uh, when markets are colluded and uh, protected by some elites and there are a lot of regulations, what ends up happening is that we have huge informal economy where, where people with their creativity and with the, 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 the few tools that they have, they create these informal markets. And, and those are, for example, the women or the, or the clients of, of Mikrao, women that have been excluded from formal economy that do not have access to bank credits and that through me crowd can make their dream come true. And I see that sometimes imagination and creativity, which are aspects that you include in your article and that are essential to being an entrepreneur, you can see them more in people within this informal economy than the ones that are already you know used to being protected by the government and and you know like with this uh, cronism that's right and that makes perfectly uh, perfectly good sense the, the the crony markets or the controlled markets are going to uh, uh, encourage people not to be creative because they don't have to be responsive to the market they don't have to be uh, competing they don't have to be innovative instead they are very well aware that their clients really are the bureaucrats who are bestowing favors and bestowing subsidies on them. So they're crafting their products for them. So it's uh, people who are not able to participate in that market, uh, they have to then be extra creative and work around the system 
Uh, but it's a beautiful thing that, uh, you know, it, if we try to say uh, there's something wrong with uh, with poor people or, or wrong with with uh, with women in particular, they they can't do it. All of these in, uh, 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 informal markets prove the exact opposite of that. That they, uh, you know, despite all of the obstacles and the barriers, their natural human creativity and ambition finds a way within whatever constraints they are they are operating. So the point then just is if you imagine. What would happen if we actually allowed all of that creativity more scope? We remove many of the artificial social restrictions that say things like, well, you know, little girls shouldn't be educated or little girls shouldn't be interested in money or, or, or uh, you know, we, we can't trust you to sign contracts in your own name and so forth. Now, a lot of that is not necessarily a legal or political framework, but are as cultural attitudes. That if those attitudes then are relaxed and liberalized, then women uh, can uh, uh, can flourish to the extent of their their capacities. And then the same thing would hold with respect to the overlay of legal restrictions that are are held on women. Now, let me just give you one one example. Um, you know, I, I work in Illinois, and the biggest city in Illinois is Chicago. And Chicago is one of the most prosperous uh, nations uh, or cities rather, rather in, the, in the United States and the United States is extraordinarily prosperous. But it still is the case that uh, in Chicago, there are some very poor neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are approaching second world and third world status. And uh, it's easy for many people to say, well, there's something wrong with the people in those neighborhoods. But when you look more closely, what you find is it's the exact same problem with nations that are the poorest of the poor nations around the world. It's mostly dysfunctional culture and dysfunctional political system. So the example I often think of, and it's a, it's a tragedy, is there's any number of women who uh, became pregnant when they were younger and they have had a couple of children, uh, but because of welfare uh, disincentives, if they get married to the father, then they will get less welfare. So the father's don't hang around and don't marry them. So you have a cultural dysfunction that's a result in part of a political disincentive. But then the women have a number of children, but they haven't given up yet and they start to become creative and they say, okay, I need to get a job of some sort, but I have children. But there are other women, young women in my situation who also have children. So let's start a daycare where we will rotate. I will look after your children some days and, and and so that way we can all work, but we also have a trusted network of people to, uh, to look after our children and so on. And they'll become very creative. But the problem is as soon as the city government officials become aware of these informal babysitting networks, they get shut down because they don't have a license, because they haven't been inspected from six different government inspectors. They haven't paid the $2,500 in license fees in order to operate a legal daycare. And of course, th these poor women are not going to be able to go through all of those bureaucratic hurdles and raise all of the capital. So necessarily either they have to fly under the radar and be very informal, uh, and that's going to make it more difficult for them, or they just get shut down by the government. So in most cases, uh, it's those dysfunctional cultural attitudes that are then politicized. That's the biggest obstacle poor women face. With that example, it reminds me also of uh, an example that William Easterly gave in, in his book, The White Man's Burden, where there were women mm. in Africa trying to organize themselves to have uh, schools where each of them like uh, divided the, any uh, class topic, like some of them would teach math and others history and other science Perfect. because they were working in communities where there was a lot of HIV. And so formal schools didn't want to send teachers there. But whenever like the World Bank would find about these informal schools, they wouldn't give them money because they didn't uh, have all the, the, the paperwork needed mm. in order to apply to some loan or, or subsidy or, or help. And, and it, it's exactly what you're saying about Chicago. Uh, either you go super informal or you cannot meet the standards and then you have to wor work in, this, in these lines. And that, that yeah. is the current situation of uh, many women in Latin America. And uh, I think it's, it, it makes it more difficult to have what you call in your article, a commitment to self-development. 
Uh, mm. that, that commitment to self-development is going to become more difficult if you cannot meet the standards to be formal and legal and also yeah. you cannot you know like condemn yourself to poverty so you're always working in this gray area right particularly if you're a, a young woman and you're ambitious about your life you want to have a you know, you want to have children because children can be a great source of joy. You want to have a, an extended family life and friendship, and you want to have a career and be financially independent and so on. So all of those things are enormous energy drains. So if you add on to all of that psychological pressure right, and, uh, and outright legal prohibitions, uh, of course, it's going, to, uh, it's going to defeat many young women, and they will then, then end up uh, giving up at a certain point. But again, the international examples are, are, are striking. Um, you know, if you think about a country like Botswana in Southern Africa, where 50 years ago it was desperately poor, and the same thing could be said about uh, Korea and Hong Kong and Singapore, 50 or 60 years ago, everybody there was desperately poor, including the, uh, including the women there, but they liberalized their economy, they respected entrepreneurship, they had a rule of law, they paid careful attention to their, uh, their money and kept their money sound. They limited government. They had contractual uh, uh, disputes would be resolved more or less efficiently in a court of law. And all of those countries uh, outperformed all of their neighbors by a significant margin. And you find some of the most accomplished women in the world in Botswana, Singapore, South Korea, and, and Hong Kong. And that's in, in, uh, in less than one generation. So uh, there's no reason why in Latin America the same thing can't happen. Let's talk about uh, precisely rules. Uh, uh, and, and I like uh, how you end your, your article. It reminded me of a, a quote that I often say, especially in Latin America, where sometimes what it's legal is not moral. And Federico oh. Bastiat also talked about that, right? Uh, uh, sometimes when, when you have to face following a law that is, uh, that is absolutely moral, you have to choose in between your own morality or, or, or legality. Um, yeah like some rules are to be followed and some rules are and some situations uh, requires for some rules to be broken and when you are trying to get out of poverty in systems where sometimes um it's not your own merit what is uh um what can be uh, your your mortar for success, but sometimes you live in mm. societies where if you are corrupted or if you have the the right connections, you can move up in the in the social scale. Mm -hmm. Then it is hard to have your own moral compass as to say, wait, what are the rules that I'm supposed to follow, and what are the rules that I uh, that I that I have to break. And you put yeah. the example of, of uh, little kids when they say to their parents, you're not the boss of me, you know, like I can do whatever I want. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think rules are, are in uh, different categories of seriousness. Obviously, in many cases, there are rules that are, that are completely inappropriate. You know, you can imagine just in an easy family context, it's a small political unit. You know, the dad can make the rules, but the dad can be a complete dictator and a bad person. And the mere fact that this dad has said, this is the rule, does not make that rule right. And if you're a, a young child, as a matter of self-preservation and self-development, then uh, the, the moral thing is precisely to defy your father when you can get away with it, to stand up to your father when you have enough strength, or to go around behind your father's back if he really is a tyrant and a, and a dictator. So the same thing holds when you scale up to, uh, to societies at, at large. So what I would say is, uh, you know, if, if you live in a country that is you know, outright dictatorial and it is oppressing you, you, know, you have a right to make a living, to be productive, to trade with whom you want, and to, to look after yourself and your family. If your own government is making it impossible for you to do so, then you have a right, I think, to break as many laws as you need to in order to survive. That is, that's perfectly fine. If you're in a basically decent country, but one that has some illegitimate rules, and that's going to be by most of the, the, uh, the countries around the world, but uh, the minimally decent uh, criterion here is going to be that it's a country or, or, or a city or a state level wherever, where you can enter into the political process, you can have a voice, 
you can challenge the rules and you can debate the rules, then I think it's appropriate to follow the rules but become an activist and to stand up to them and uh, explain why you think the rules are wrong and lobby for those rules to be, to be changed. Uh, and then if the, the third kind of rules is, of course, uh, the rules that you think are decent rules, uh, then to the extent that you understand why the rules are the way they are and they do fit with your moral compass, then follow those rules and encourage other people to do the same. So the point though is uh, that rules are human contrivances and good rules are supposed to respect individuality, uh, respect people's right to live their life as they see fit to prosper and flourish. Uh, uh, and uh, there's lots of experiments with respect to rules and so some rules are failures and uh, when they are failures, don't be afraid to challenge them and break them uh, if they are inappropriate. And you're talking about also not being afraid and this is uh, how you end your article talking about the fears, fears of making those uh, self-investments and improvements and also yeah. a fear of failure, uh, of, of, of disappointment uh, to, to what society is expecting from you, which is also part yeah. of what happens to some of those women in Latin America, like going against tradition, going against a culture that has a little bit of machismo, of victimism, of the, of the mentality that you by yourself can, cannot acquire a means for for a, for a good life. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you talk about discarding tradition and what are, are the aspects of tradition because each culture can have things that are more detrimental than others. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have a problem with traditions as long as uh, we think it's a tradition that's a, that's a good tradition. But you know, just the fact that it's a tradition does not really mean anything. There are lots of terrible traditions. So each of us then has to assess the tradition that's being offered to us, do I think it's good, right, or, or not. So you mentioned a, right, a couple of things. I mean, one kind of tradition, of course, is an old-fashioned uh, chauvinism, right, or, or machismo, where right, men want to be superior and women are then trained from a young age to be, in some sense, sub subservient to, uh, to men. And uh, you know, I think there's a, you know, a lot of interesting sexual psychology at work there about how men and women relate to each other. But when it comes to business, when it comes to politics for certain, I don't think there's any place for that at all. So uh, if you are a young woman and you are in that culture, uh, I think the important thing is to say you have your life to live on your own terms. It's not that your life uh, and how high you can rise and what kinds of things you can do in your life should be decided by men who are in many cases are protecting their relatively frail egos. And I would uh, want to point out that no self-respecting man that I know uh, wants a weak woman who just sucks up to him. Right? The, the men who are genuinely self-confident uh, uh, they want a strong woman. They want an intelligent woman. They want to admire their wife. And they, of course, they want their wife, their girlfriend, and so forth to admire them. But they recognize that you know, it, being admired by someone doesn't mean anything if it's coming from someone who's not accomplished in her own right. So uh, you know, real men, to put it bluntly, want real women. And real women should only uh, accept uh, the standards that are coming from real men. So uh, don't give up on your, your ambitions for yourself and uh, see through machismo as a, as a kind of weakness or a cover for, for, for weakness. And then, of course, if it's instantiated in a legal code, then uh, to put it bluntly, fight like hell to get rid of all of those double standards that are in the legal code. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hicks, for all these uh, important insights, because I think that uh, Mikral is, is, is uh, trying to do that, uh, helping women to escape either tradition or legal barriers or cultural barriers that have impeded them to become the the, the true stars uh, of their own lives and, and they deciding what to do with the money that, that they get. And also everything that you, you, you've spoken about, I think goes hand in hand with understanding that there's also a psychological component of looking for strong individuals with high self-esteem who respect those individual rights in others in order to have a society that has uh, progress and, and prosperity for everybody, which the, uh, puts a distance in between that uh, 
uh, discourse that now is running about saying that you know capitalism uh, it, it, it never has the best interest for humanity and is shallow mm. and it's about just like earning money and, and greed and understanding with, with this interview that you just uh, gave us that there are uh, deep components of, um, of psychology, of uh, self-esteem and emotional intelligence that go hand in hand with becoming a, a self-sustainable individual that also has something to offer to, to society. And um, to, to say thank you to you, and also uh, before we leave, if you can please share with our audience, how can they follow on your work, your publications, your social media, uh, mm -hmm. how can people uh, you know, research more about uh, the important work that you do? Okay, well, yes, entrepreneurship is uh, close to my heart and I've done quite a bit of work on uh, the psychology of entrepreneurship, the ethics of entrepreneurship, and uh, as you and I have been discussing, the, some of the political aspects that impinge upon entrepreneurship. So, uh, most of the, my, my work is uh, available via my website, so it's stephenhicks.org. Uh, uh, so that should be fairly easily accessible. And I also do spend a little bit of time at Facebook and at Twitter, not very much. Uh, I do also have a new platform, ThinkSpot, do regular lectures on a variety of topics and Q&As. But I would think stephenhicks.org would be the best place to start. And thank you for mentioning my Wall Street Journal article, which is directly on these themes. Maybe that would be the, the first thing to start with. Thank you so much, Professor Hicks. And for all of you to comment and share uh, this session and all the sessions of Micral, we'll see you in the next time. All right. A pleasure. Thank you.